like vibe with? Wait, yeah, well, Nathan's not here yet. <laughs> Should he not just join? He can just join in. I just want to get your views on Hegel down on the um, on the well, record. Yeah. Oh, my views on Hegel. Um, he has what, some... what are you saying about Hegel, right? Start from you're saying Hegel's juicy. Go. Yeah, um, it's some real juicy philosophy when you analyze it in, I don't know, a certain way because some takeaways from Hegel's philosophy, like, you know, let's say some of his political philosophy was pretty, I don't know, it was extremely flawed. It was basically like a reactionary conservative. Mm. But if you combine like, you know, Hegel's philosophy with an analysis of material conditions, then you get Marxism, which is by far the best philosophy out there, mm. to me anyways. Do you not think that Hegel has a problem with it because it's characterized too much by the negative? He's always going on about the negative and he, he mm-hmm. sees things in terms of like everything contradicting each other, you know? Yeah. And I think that like part of the critique of it that was made of him mm-hmm. is that maybe we should be thinking in terms of like positivity instead of reactivity and, and mm-hmm. like instead of talking about like things negating each other, thinking in terms of what we can do, like, like affirmative forces, you know, know. like going in their own direction without referring to anything else. Active and reactive forces, like in Nietzsche. To be fair, for Hegel, I feel negation is creation, though. Like, you know, his whole concept of negation, it's like negating, I don't know, like, it's negating certain aspects in a way to create. So, like, you know, when a chemical reaction creates something, that's because it's negating, like, to other other things, kind of, like... So when I think Hegel refers to negation, it isn't just like a sort of like destruction of everything. It's more like a, I don't know, it's more like this negation of like the past state of something into something new. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, his view of like negation is more like a sort of creation. Like that's basically, you know, dialectics you see in like Heraclitus, you know, you see it in, that's who you see it in Marx, you know, like, do you not think that maybe his um, the way that he describes synthesis is kind of too simplistic? Like okay. this idea that like there's one force and another force and they mm-hmm. come together. There's the what is it, the thesis and the and the antithesis, and then they make yeah. the synthesis. Whereas do, do you not think that that's a bit reductive? Like, because in reality, there's not just one force and another force. There's mm-hmm. like you know, an enormous multiplicity of forces that interact with each other in all kinds of different ways. And and maybe to say that synthesis, antithesis, uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis is a bit reductive and, and boils things down too much. I mean, um, I'd say that, like, if you look at, <clears throat> if you kind of look at it, maybe he's not referring to, like, you know, those are the only two forces guiding history. I think it's more like those are the two, like, you know, main forces or those are the two main forces in that, like, epoch. So let's say, for example, to use an analogy, um, if you take, like, Batman versus Superman, it's not like only Batman and Superman were in that movie, um, you know. There were other characters, but Batman and Superman were the main driving forces of that movie. So that's mm. why it's called Batman versus Superman. Mm. Yeah, I see. To use that, that analogy, if you get what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So a lot of like, I mean, things with a lot of like Hegel's philosophy, I shouldn't just p- be purely read of like face value. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you should, it should have like some degree of like interpretation. I did like the master slave stuff where he was going on about how um, people kind of, mm-hmm. the slaves allowed themselves to be slaves kind of in a sense, because they didn't mm-hmm. see themselves as being free. And so it's very like it would Kanye be West esque. What's that, sorry? It's very Kanye West esque. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you couldn't really make people into slaves that saw themselves as free individuals. And so like the, the liberation of the slaves de- is dependent on the way that they view themselves. And, and in a way they don't view themselves as individuals. And that's what allows them to be subsumed in the yeah. in the um by the master or whatever. Okay, I guess what you're saying, but like, you know, at the same time, I don't think it's so, you can't boil it down to the slaves' view of themselves. You, you have to like talk about, you know, <clears throat> a, a Nathan. Wait, that was.
I can cut out the pause. Okay. It'll be seamless, you know, because of my video, video editing skills. It'll be some immaculate. Wait, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, right, nice. You're going to put the camera on or not? It should be on. Wait, oh, it's... hang on. It's... I need to remove the blue tack. Hey. Yo. Yo, I love the setup, by the way. I love the... I love the I love the background. Oh, it's my wardrobe. <laughs> but I mean, still with the poster and stuff. Like, oh, I'm late. I was just getting some coffee. No, I like the blue tag on the camera. Very wise, you know, blocking yeah. the. Well, if if the Zook does it, then that's right. I gotta do it. <laughs> of course. I use masking tape. Yeah, so, that um, works. So um, I was about to say, Nathan, um, introduce yourself. Oh. um... My name's Nathan. Um, I do many things in my spare time, including um, taking the make out of Aaron, um, shutting down all these arguments and explaining why he's wrong. What's he wrong uh, about? What isn't he wrong about? <laughs> 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 no, jokes aside. Um, yeah, uh, I am a philosophy society. Um, I study philosophy. Um, I make a lot of music in my spare time. Um, I mix music. Uh, I like to party. What kind of music? Uh, mostly electronic music. Um, mm. We can put the lot. link in your in the in like the video description. We can put the link to your music. Yeah, can do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've not released any music online as of yet, but I've released some mixes. Um, nice. so that's out there. Um, apart from that, uh, I spend my time doing artwork and reading. Mm. and debating what? veganism on the internet ah yes well i thought we'd leave that for a little bit <laughs> oh fair enough fair um, enough. Uh, but um i just wonder like what are your like main arguments though um well um, i suppose my main reason for maintaining veganism is the moral aspect of it okay yeah as, as soon as i was able to recognize like the, mm -hmm. the sense of being in something else, you know, it's ability yeah. to suffer. I couldn't then justify mm -hmm. my actions, you know, after, after making that realization. I've had, a, I've had a pet dog for the last you know, 11 years. And the way that a dog acts is not so much different to the way that a cow or a pig acts. You know, they, they have the same individuality you know, mm -hmm. they all have a, their, their own personalities but some dogs will like a certain type of dog food some dogs will like to run around some dogs just sit around all day and eat cheese you know it's entirely dependent on the creature's preferences you know it, i find it very bizarre that we've designated certain animals as food animals and certain animals as pleasure animals you know comfort animals um, and then certain animals as work animals yeah. I, mean, I think it says a lot about human nature really i mean it's kind of like um you know if you look at uh, when when everyone talks about you know the way chinese like eat dog like they eat dogs in like china and stuff like mm. if you mention oh would you eat like dog people will be horrified like you know exactly you, you sick fucking psycho like inconsistency that that motivates me to not only boycott animal products but to promote mm -hmm. the ideology you know, promote the the arguments really yeah, yeah. Do, you have, do you have a story on how you became vegan or not like do you have like a moment in time where you were like i'm gonna be a vegan yeah it, it was kind of so it was a, a gradual sort of thinking about it, but there was just a point where it was like, well, why am I doing this? I, I could literally just not go and buy more of this stuff and buy other stuff. Like, it's that simple of a switch. It's just picking something else up at the shop as opposed to what you, you're used to. Um, I, I was vegetarian from like 17 to, to 19. And then I thought, well, there's no real difference between you know, consuming a non-meat animal product and a, an animal product with regards to the, the amount of suffering that goes into it. 
In fact, if I look at it from the standpoint of suffering, there's probably the, the animal, say, say a dairy cow, for instance, they live an average of 10 years as opposed to three years for a beef cow. Um, you know, they still get turned into beef anyways down the line. Uh, but if you're not eating meat, but you're still buying into dairy, you're still causing just as much suffering, if not more, because it's prolonged. Um, you know, there's also the, the suffering of like a beef cow will just be confined until the day that it's big enough to be sold and chopped up for profit or whatever. Um, whereas a, a dairy cow gets impregnated every single year and has a young forcibly removed from them every single year. Otherwise, we can't then take them from it. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand why cows produce milk. Like, why does a human woman produce milk? To feed the young. Exactly. So if, if we're getting that milk, then what happens to the young? <laughs> Killed. Exactly. I mean, Although, sorry, go on. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, carry on here. What were you saying? So, well, they'll either be killed, um, the males will generally just be killed there and then. Um, the females will either be sold off to, you know, other dairy farms or to meat producing farms. Um, sometimes they, they, in Britain, especially, they send it abroad to like France or somewhere where restrictions are less um, opposed to, to raising uh, veal, for instance, which is like just making calves stand in a box till like the one two years old and, and they kill them because the meat isn't as uh haven't used the muscles as much so the meat isn't as tender and then it's delicacy you can charge for that and make profit from it as opposed to just throwing it in the skip or making dog food out of them it seems like we treat animals a bit like they're machines you know like yeah. we optimize the output of, of a product you know like beef steak or whatever and we don't yeah. have any regard for their feelings or, or anything because we just see them as being like robots yeah I, I think the industry definitely sees them that way um i'm fairly confident that people in general um have an understanding that animals can suffer you know that's why we see lots of advertising campaigns to say you know this is a happy free range family farm or whatever. Um, or, you know, we only use, we only um, get meat that's supplied by, or that's approved by a tractor, for instance, which is, you know, entirely just a marketing ploy. Um, the standards that they are supposed to enforce aren't any better than if they weren't enforced at all, really. Um, you know, th there's all sorts of evidence to support that as well. Um, you actually look deep enough, you know, just behind what Tesco's puts out in the media and part of their advertising. I mean, a, a great example for why Red Tractor has a vested interest in hiding the truth is the, the current manager or the current CEO of Red Tractor, one of the people that established it as well, used to be on the board of Tesco's. God damn. So, yeah, literally, like... <laughs> So if, <laughs> you just got to think, like, what, what the hell's going on there? I mean, I think that's just a massive, like, not just a problem with, like, the food industry, but a problem with, you know, the government as a whole, like, you know, not just in, like, you know, the US, but also in, like, the UK, where many of the top members, like, are, they are essentially lobbied by, you know, certain private yeah. corporations. That's just how... No, the government works like they pay the government or you know existing industry to like well to benefit them <laughs> as yeah. opposed to you know what's going to be best for public health and the environment i mean this is a bit of a tangent but i mean i was actually discussing with um a mate yesterday about you know when whenever the uk apparently fucks up or whatever like let's say for example we had this transport secretary a few years ago who put money into, you know, a furry company with no furries. That wasn't him being incompetent. That was him funneling money into a private channel for him and his cronies' benefits. Yeah. That was purely yeah. calculated. 
Oh, yeah. his real job. Yeah. Yeah. That's his real job to funnel money into the hands of private interests. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need to establish our own systems, you know? Exactly. Over we do. Independent. Mm, cooperatives and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, this is where cryptocurrency comes into it. Mm. Smart contracts decide our own interest rates that you know are based on the economic climate as opposed to just somebody literally deciding what the interest rates are going to be. I don't know about cryptocurrencies, you know, because I think that um, I think that obviously the idea of them was very good, like decentralized currencies, not just you know under the hegemony of any authority. But it seems like in practice, all they are is like a way for speculative investors to make a lot of money. You know, it doesn't really, you know what I mean? Well, it seems like they've been co-opted by by the financial institutions. Yeah. If you see the internet as a as a case study, um, you know, we had the dot net boom where people were yeah. literally just using it to make lots of money very fast. But then after all that kind of wound down, people started to use it for its more intended purpose. Um, so, you know, like sharing information and such. But then obviously industry has come along and manipulated that for their own benefit as well. Um, it seems like we've replicated in the internet. Like obviously when the internet came out, it was just a sandbox, but it seems mm. like now the same kind of monopolistic power structures have, you know, organized the internet in their own way, like Facebook and Twitter and like these giant corporations and stuff that have, taken control of the internet and structured it in the same way as the outside world mm. i mean one common theme i see across all this is that you know the internet the animal industry even is that it is all run by you know the capitalist like ruling class so what we could do i feel is you know cut all the cut you know stab the body of the hydra rather than cut off individual heads you know stab the body of the hydra and I thought about this. What is, what is the, the capitalist body, <laughs> the hydro um, body? <laughs> it's those who own and control, you know, the means of production. Like those, you get what I'm saying? Like those. Well, are, um, the thing about uh, the people that are at the top of capitalism, they're, they're generally psychopaths. Uh, they're the people that have a desire to rise to the top of the hierarchy. So if we're if we're going to remove any potential for somebody to fill the void, we have to remove the, the tendency to be at the top of the hierarchy from the whole of human nature. That's what I see as the body of the hydra. I thought about it for a while because you know no matter how many nefarious people you either lock up or you, you ostracize, there's always going to be somebody else. Who thinks, well, you know, I I have more of a drive to be at the top than this person. You know he might be virtuous or whatever, but fuck virtue i don't care about virtue i'll just kill them and go to the top do you not think that nature is created by the very system we live in and promoted within us to by you know <clears throat> the wider superstructure that makes up capitalism actually hmm. do you not think it's more a, a system thing first rather than a nature first thing like but the you, system you, creates our idea of nature you mean our idea of what our nature is certain yeah you've got to think like surely it doesn't surely the system arises out of the nature i mean i guess if you'd have to look all the way back to you know i guess you have, you'd have to look all the way back to the beginnings of like class society um maybe it's a sort of feedback loop then yeah so human nature creates a system which then manipulates human nature, which then creates new systems. And Epigenetic transformation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like so, chicken or egg. It's very chicken, chicken or egg, which came first, you know. Well, you know what I think about chickens and eggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of which, um, I think the main problem with the meat industry like I'm, I'm an absolute hypocrite on this point because i'm filthy meat eater i'm a filthy you know animal product consumer um well I so feel, was i for 20 years of my life um. i feel the main problem is like um <clears throat> not necessarily the concept of meat in itself which i mean it's very flawed but the main problem is the way it's executed 
No pun intended. See, for it depends what aspect you're looking at it from. Yeah. So I, people people uh, like to say, oh, well, I would prefer if all of my meat was grass-fed, mm -hmm. for example. Um, now, that, that causes a lot of problems in itself because the factory farming system is actually farm grass-feeding all of the meat to feed the population with grass-fed stuff. Yeah. It's just going to use more resources. It's going to be far more mm -hmm. damaging to the environment. And from a, you know, from a moral standpoint, mm -hmm. say you want to euthanize somebody, you wouldn't euthanize somebody that's happy and healthy and wants to keep on living. You would euthanize them when they're suffering, when they want to die. So mm -hmm. arguably killing an animal that's been in a factory farm in an awful situation is more humane than killing something that's been out to pasture that has been living its life and wants to continue living a happy life. And when we come and kill it. It's, it's, it's this idea that the market perpetuates an idea of humane slaughter being a possibility. Like, how can you benevolently kill something that doesn't want to be killed? It's, it's a misnomer. Well, here's a question. Uh, what if, would you eat an animal that had died of natural causes? Like, let's say that you are like... Depends what it's died from. <laughs> All right, let's say that you're living in a tribe, right, in the in the desert ah, or something. Okay. And you saw a camel walking like across the road and like a wild camel and it was struck by lightning. Would you go over and have a little munch on it? Well, yeah. Um so I I'm what's called a freegan. So say my roommate is going to throw some meat out, you know, it's well within date. He's bought that so he's contributed to the supply and demand aspect of it. He's or she have actively asked the market to produce more next time so they can sell it. Now, as, as they were just going to throw it away, me then consuming that hasn't contributed to this, this market cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, whilst there might be some health detriments to, to doing that, um, I don't see any moral options apart from maybe sticking to your principles. Um, but... With regards to you know the, the camel the camel question, um, if you're in a, a primitive society and you don't have any other option but to eat meat, then that's that's a whole different situation. You know we live in a, a modernized society where you know the vast majority of people are pretty well educated. You know we have a, a sense of right and wrong, uh, and we don't have the necessity to use animal products. We have other options. Um, so therefore, I think we have the moral obligation, you know, as you know, a being with the capability of higher functions, we have that responsibility to not commit unnecessary acts of cruelty. I mean, I think if I had to state one problem with, like, you know, the vegan movement as a whole, like, you know, I'm not going to try and stereotype all vegans. I'm just saying, you know, these are elements I've seen from certain people within the vegan movement, but like. One thing I see a lot is that they kind of neglect like people outside the first world. Like, you know, they don't like sometimes, you know, in camp campaigning against the um, <clears throat> eating, like, you know, eating meat and stuff. Mm. They'll kind of like neglect the third world. You know, some communities, like, let's say Inuit communities, they fully rely on like, you know, meat and. I mean, also there's instances, let's say when the harvest is, the harvest fails, then you may need to like, you know, consume me. So I agree. Um, a lot of people do neglect the fact that a lot of communities only have that as their, their main resource. Um, counter to that, the Western demand for certain parts of animals, say chicken breast, uh, mm -hmm and chicken thighs or whatever, what happens to the rest of it? Well, the rest of it gets sold because it can't get sold in a Western market because you know our palates are too delicate for that. Um, <laughs> or most people's are anyway. Um, that, that meat just gets sold to third world countries, which undercuts the prices of local producers. Hmm. And you know, it has a real impact on the agricultural industries in third world countries. Um, Not honest. Um, but there is also an argument that people that live in the West are involved in the Western society. 
and within the Western society it isn't necessary. Yeah. It depends though. It depends because a lot of the time nowadays, like a lot of vegan options are very pricey. They're very overpriced. Like, you know, so some like families of a certain, like, you know, and let's say working class families may need to use like meat based options for their like food or whatever. Well, the price of alternative options is only ever going to come down if they become more profitable, i.e. more people buy into them currently. Mm -hmm. The more money that you put into a product now means that the industry is able to invest more money into, you know, expanding their means of production, making mass production yeah. more plausible, you know, minimizing uh, the price per item that they're producing, which means they can sell it to the consumer for a lower price. And it means that they can also reinvest some expendable income into improving the product so that it's more pal uh, palatable to the mass market. And, you know, who's to say that eventually meat-based alternatives actually don't actually become better than the current meats that we have or animal products. Like, say, say, for instance, we could uh, grow a chicken loin steak in a lab or something, but it has the marble fat of a Wagyu steak or something you know, superior meat to what we can get from animals. And that, that's only going to happen if people now buy into it. I'll tell you the problem. The problem is subsidization. Oh, like, it, it is a big problem. Subsidized. I agree. Um, is. But you, you can argue that the subsidization is there to prevent external, so say, so if we move subsidies in the UK and people are still wanting to consume meat, yeah. so the price of meat goes up. If people aren't accustomed to eating meat alternatives, they're just going to go elsewhere. So Tesco's is going to start buying uh, their chicken from France, say, if it's cheaper than in the UK. And that, that's a, a, an argument for keeping subsidisation for now. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, if say you're a, a sheep farmer, Without and you just let your sheep graze and you sell the wool. It's actually more profitable to just bail up the grass that those sheep are grazing on and sell that than it is to sell and maintain the sheep. Mm -hmm. You know, without the subsidies. And uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Clarkson did a an experiment where he tried to run a farm, and I think somebody told him that exact same thing. You know, <laughs> the reason it's not profitable, Jeremy, is because you're not getting tax rebates. <laughs> <laughs> So you might as well just sell the grass, mate. You'd actually make some money. <laughs> it opens up a whole question of like how, you know, like the veganism question in society, um, like how we eat determines the kind of society that we live in. Like it's all very individualistic, like the way that we mm. produce food because each of us have our own kitchen and we go and buy our own produce and like each of us in, in a little container cooks food for ourselves. Whereas like, yeah. I'm not sure that that would have ever been, uh, I think that in the past eating was a lot more communal. You know? Yeah, there was a ritual around it as well. Yeah. It's like even today in third world countries, if they if they hunt an animal, if they are hunting an animal. They like to have rituals before they go on the hunt, or they'll have rituals after they've gone on the hunt whilst the the butchering it. You know, as a respect for the planet that is, you know, sacrifice this animal so that they can keep living. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's it's literally like you're just paying somebody else to go and kill an animal for you. And there's no no thought about you know that animal's welfare or you know what's gone into producing it because all we see is just a piece of meat wrapped in plastic on a shelf. I wonder how it would change things if instead of having one kitchen per house, you had one kitchen per street, you know, and you had like some more, you know like a more communal way of eating, you know, mm. like uh, like sat around the campfire almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could have one guy in there cooking for everybody, you know. Hmm. Isn't that basically a soup kitchen? Yeah, but a soup, you know, one, one kitchen per street, you know, and he makes the food for everyone. One day you have spaghetti bolognese or whatever, the other day you have whatever, you know. Ooh. And uh, hmm. it would be more, a lot more communal. It's funny how, like, the way that we live is, like, built into the architecture. You know, like, everybody lives in their own self-contained house. And, yeah, uh, we all sleep in our own separate bed. Yeah, yeah. It's all yeah. very individualistic. You know, maybe we should open it up a bit, you know. Hmm, hmm. Isn't, yeah, that um, isn't that basically what the hippie movement tried to do? 
Sure. Yeah, a lot of communes. Yeah. Free love, man. Mm -hmm. To be fair, I think it was Count Dankula that I first heard this idea from. And he was saying, um, say we've got on the internet, you've got little communities of people that yeah. you know, they have their own rules, they have their own structures mm -hmm. and ideas, and they stick within that community. Yeah. What if it was like that in real life where, you know, say all the Marxists just moved to one part of England, made their own little <laughs> community there. If you didn't agree with the ideology, you, you move somewhere else. You, you go to the conservative, mm -hmm. I don't know, fascist part of <laughs> Britain. <laughs> or, you know, you go to the you know, anime weeb city or whatever. <laughs> Everyone's got their own little... <laughs> but I think that, that would only ever happen if the current political social systems I guess dissolve mm -hmm. but that's only going to happen if public perception changes on mass to be fair you could make a lot you could make a lot of money being that a communist cat girl because you could go in between nations very easily <laughs> oh. ah, but the trouble with that it's a cool idea it, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of problems with it though because if you look at the fascist side, the conservative fascist side, one thing they'll want to do is expand. Yeah, take like everything need, else over. <laughs> yeah. they, they'll need to expand by their own necessity. Like one of the problems with capitalism and... Well, no this is where the right to bear arms comes into play. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so we basically have like a constant like, you know, war between different factions. Or just mutually assured destruction. Okay. This worked quite well for them. Mind you, you just get loads of little proxy wars. <laughs> <laughs> the anime weebs won't be able to defend themselves because they'll be trying to use katanas. You know? Like they'll be against running around. nukes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, mind you, the Japanese already tried that and failed, didn't they? <laughs> Sorry, you might want to edit that out. <laughs> no, don't worry. This is not This is. Oh, boy. Well, we, there goes we my career anything. before it's even started. <laughs> ah, but, um,. Honestly, I like that. I actually think that in theory it would be really cool, you know. It would yeah, be really in cool. theory. Yeah. But like, you know, in practice it would be like, and even still, like, let's say we have like the anime faction. You'd, on one hand, you get like, you know, the communist cat girls. But on the other hand, you'd also have like these, like, you know, like neckbeards. Yeah, the neo Nazi neckbeard types. It'd be so much <laughs> infighting. Oh, boy. There'd be a lot of sexual assault, I imagine. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying how it is. True. You've seen what's going on in all these game companies, man. What is it, Blizzard? Yeah. They're having some serious troubles with sexual misconduct in the workplace. Also, have you oh. seen Netbeard? Have you, have, have you ever seen anything on Reddit surrounding Netbeards? Isn't that just Reddit? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's literally somewhere that's dedicated to people, you know, detailing their experiences with certain neckbeards. Oh, boy. It'll be like, you know, I was an 18-year-old girl, this 20-year-old neckbeard or whatever, tried to... It's just like, you know, there's so many stories of, like, neckbeard communities, like... Oh, you know... I, I, I would love to know what's going through the head of, like, a... The neckbeard is neckbeard. Honestly, um, to be fair, like, you know, if you had, like, the neckbeard is, like, neckbeard, you'd probably see them on the internet because they're such, like, a neckbeard, they would have, like, you know, come to, like, online fame or something. Mm. Like, they probably have, like, a whole troll community surrounding them. I suppose the, <laughs> the pinnacle of neckbeards, without actually having a neckbeard, is, uh... oh, my God, what's his name? I've completely Chris forgot. Chan. Chris Chan. Chris yes, Chan. you read my freaking mind, man. You know what you're oh, but I mean, in the news. Yeah, I saw the I saw it ages oh, ago. Oh, oh. I will confess though, like this is one of my confessions to which will probably not get me any job offers anytime like anytime soon, but I'm an avid Christorian. I quite like Chris Chan. I think he's been very manipulated by a lot of people and yeah. there's this one woman that uh, has actually Bella. Uh, recently yeah the, the really dirty one that's very mm -hmm. nasty who was kind of egging him on to do this you know chris chan is massively autistic yeah you know and incredibly sexually deprived so as soon as he's got a girl 
that's given in communication. A boyfriend, free girl <laughs> as well. As soon as somebody like that is interacting with him and egging him on, of course he's going to fucking do yeah. deplorable stuff. Like, Have you heard about this guy, Harry, or not? I know about him, but I don't know what you're talking about that he's done lately. Um, He raped his elderly mother with dementia multiple times. Because and admitted it to somebody because a troll kind of like egged him on to do it. But this is a really menti- mentally handicapped person as well. Yeah. Um, it's a very dark saga. It is a very dark saga. It's like a, it was like 20 years in the making as well. Yeah. It's all just led up to this crescendo, so to speak. Crescendo. Crescendo. Oh, crescendo. <laughs> oh, no. I will say, um, one thing I will say is that it's not even just, I don't think it's like just the autism. I think it's like there's other like conditions. Like there's tons of other stuff that, like, you know. Yeah, it's definitely it's a, been, yeah. got a yeah. lot going on. But anyway, um, <clears throat> no, nah, honestly, like it's a whole saga. Like we could do a, we could do a whole podcast on. Oh my God, know. right. There's there's one channel on YouTube. Kino that's Samuel. got multiple three hour videos on Chris Dan. Like 60 plus videos of just describing the Chris Chan story because it's just it's that much, man. Yeah. That gets me onto a point of like, you know, like reality TV. Although reality TV is like, you know, entertaining, a lot of people don't realize that there's so much better stuff out there. There's so much more out there stuff than what's shown on reality TV. Yeah, stuff that literally makes you what the actual fuck. Did I just hear or watch or listen to? <laughs> it stays with you for a few days. It's yeah. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know, ti- like you know, Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger King. I haven't Tiger. actually seen that yet. Well, that was crazy, but compared to the, some of the stuff you see out there, you know, like mm. Chris Chan and stuff, it is child's play. Honestly, like it's stuff like Tiger King, that's nothing compared to. Some pretty deplorable stuff on the internet. No. Fair, that's what makes it fun, though. I'm not going to lie, though. I've seen some awful content on the internet. Like, all yeah. sorts of gore, all sorts of depravity. There's so much. Nothing actually compares to the images that I've seen happening inside factory farms. Yeah. Like, that, that shit gives me nightmares. Like, mm-hmm. I, I can't sleep at night sometimes because of the things that I've seen there. You know, I've literally seen people have their faces ripped off, have their tongues pulled through the throat. And what set, I think what sets it in my mind as worse is at least they're a human being and they have the ability to somewhat rationalise what's going on to them. Mm-hmm. Whereas an animal that, you know, has the mental abilities of, say, a three-year-old, like, a, for instance, a pig or a, a, a cow, all they know is that they're suffering. They have no idea why, and they have no possible ability to comprehend why. I mean, it's different. Like, let's say even a human was going through that thing, you know, that suffering. At least they may have a bit of time to, like, you know, accept their fate, accept, you know, this is what's going to happen. And yeah. Find peace yeah. With them. Say, say, for instance, a, a Jewish person in the, the Holocaust, you know, at, at least they know they're being persecuted because of, who they are, and the other people disagree with that for some reason. Mm-hmm. You know, a pig that's lived its whole life, you know, in a tiny little cage, or, well, no, in, in a large cage, just with lots and lots and lots of other pigs, just yeah. kind of roaming around and squirming and squealing and eating each other. It has no idea why it's there, what it's done, what could possibly be on the other side. You know, it, it doesn't know that it's being subjected to that so that we can eat its flesh and feel pleasure for 15 minutes. I mean, I think, you know, the main takeaway from that is that, you know, the most scary thing, that the most scary thing you can honestly experience or see is reality itself. Like, honestly, like, you know, what you see in slaughterhouses, what even you see, I don't know, in human societies in like third world countries, like, that's way scarier than any movie or like any sort oh, of yeah. thing. We, as in the West, we understand that that's an awful job to do as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and what happens is most of the people that actually have to slaughter animals and abattoirs are foreign workers and people that have no other opportunities really but to take these awful jobs because western people won't do it you know we're too that but you know we'll eat it that's fine we'll create the market for it and subject these animals to suffer and subject uh, these foreign workers to the horrible working conditions where they literally have to kill hundreds of animals every single day you know that takes a real psychological toll the the suicide rates within abattoir work is a, a sky high yeah i was about to ask like how does that affect the mental health of like you know certain workers like, mm. are there any stats you have or not because no i did i didn't want to say you know they are high, like the the higher than such or other or they are this yeah. high because i don't know the exact numbers i just know that it is you know it's higher than lots of other industries yeah except what lawyers <laughs> lawyers our lawyers don't have souls anyway <laughs> <laughs> to be fair we should we should start herding lawyers and eat them <laughs> they'd be tasty though are you sure that they don't work out that much that they're probably not the they'd be nice and tender then <laughs> I know there wouldn't be much. I would feel less moral objection to people eating lawyers than I would to uh, innocent sentient beings. I mean, I'd, I'd put that role to politicians, though. Well, wow, lawyers, politicians. Fair like, um, fair there is this massive... Tomato, tomato. <laughs> there is, um, you know, like, there is this massive stigma against, like, cannibalism compared to any sort of, like, you know, animal product. Yeah. But it's like, you know, we share so much of our genetics with a pig, for example. You know, so much mm-hmm. so that we can even transplant hearts from a pig with very little modification. Mm-hmm. So when you think about it, human flesh is going to taste pretty similar to, say, pork, for example. Yeah. Now, it, might, it might taste a little bit different. Um, Fair, everything tastes like chicken. In fact, the, the biggest difference it would have, or the reason for the biggest difference it would have in flavour is the fact that most people live past the age of five, which <laughs> most pigs don't. You know, and they're, they're supposed to live to about 15, 20. Are they? Same as dogs. Yeah, yeah. We well, kill pigs off when they're, they're about, you know, in, in pig years, it'd be about 20 years old, you know, about our age. And they've, they've just about reached maturity. It's like, well, you know, it just costs more money to keep you the same size. So we're just going to kill you now and then put money into making more. You know, I don't want to die yet. Exactly. Like, imagine if my life was, imagine once my parents found it, like, you know, too costly to take care of me, it was like, yeah, we're just going to kill you. Right gonna, here. No, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll kill you and sell your flesh so that we can buy, but so that we can pay to rear another child and do the same. To be fair, like, that, some parents would do that. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if some, like, real life people would actually, like, you know, do that. So, to be fair, there are stories of people selling their kids like in dire situations, like all over the world. I mean, of course, you know, and I mean, that's also not necessarily just for money, but also to give them a better life. I feel there's two ways about it, though. I think most children that get sold get sold into like um, sex slavery. Yeah, um, I mean, the parents don't know though a lot of the time the parents don't or even some know. forms yeah they just they're just like for i need to feed me and these other five kids so i'm going to sell the youngest yeah and i mean you know a lot of the times it is like i'm not saying it will give them better life of course most of the time it doesn't but the motivation behind the parents is usually i maybe these parents will give my kid a better life than i can and therefore you know mm-hmm. i would sell my kid if they were like, I would sell my kid to a ninja if they were going to apprentice them. <laughs> or, or train them in Shaolin Monastery or something. <laughs> to be a killer. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever have a kid and then they just mysteriously disappear, I'm going to watch my back. <laughs> if a ninja shows up. Ooh. I'd sell them to some kind of interdimensional magician or something. But only if they're on the condition that they become... An apprentice. And then a dimensional magician with a big white van. <laughs> and then a dimensional big white van. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> that reminds me of the Midnight Gospel. 
Mm. Like, you know, like Clancy is like, you know, like motorhome. It kind of reminds me of that in a way, but I'm not saying it's magic, but it's kind of like the concept. Do you get what I'm saying? You took your bag, man. Wait. Wait. <laughs> have we got oh, any? It... Should we, you know, bring it to a close, or have, have, is there any other topics that we should discuss? No. What do you want to discuss? Well, um, <clears throat> just stuff like, um, and even with, like, you know, regarding the whole like weakness of thing. One argument that I see time and time again is that you know, natural like you know, hunt ethical hunting. It's like, you know, not like hunting animals for your own meat, doing it yourself. Um, would, you yeah. say, would you say that's better than, you know, like the current factory farm system you, like we have, or would you say it's still unethical? Like hunting squirrels in Whitworth Park. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I suppose uh, you mean specifically as opposed to the factory farming system that we have now or opposed to a vegan diet as well um it could be but it, it could be like both or well, would you right. say it's i'll address the as opposed to vegan one first because that's easy to do um again the, there is no necessity for us decided to eat um meat for nutrients the, the only thing we can't really get is b vitamins and even then the b vitamins that we're getting from factory farming or say um subsistence farming to animals that graze on grass because there's a such a cobalt shortage in the soil that means it's very difficult for animals to absorb the b12 they're excreting but for, for, for humans for a mammal to absorb b12 they need to eat poo essentially and animals that graze that you, we produce b12 in our lower digestive tract which means that we excrete it and say a cow for instance will, you know, they'll poo onto the grass, that'll dissolve into the grass and the bacteria and stuff that are in there, that were in the microbiome, as, as well as the B12 that they've produced there, um, gets put into the soil. Now, to actually reabsorb that, the soil has to have a certain level of cobalt in it. And there is a real serious problem in the UK with depleting cobalt uh, levels in the soil. So most meat, it does contain B12, only contains B12 because it's been supplemented in the same way that a vegan would supplement it. And in the UK, there's a, I think something like 40% of people, um, I, I got this from an Earthling Ed video, so I'm fairly sure this is reliable. Something like 40% of the UK population has low or inadequate B12 concentration in the blood. And you know, 0.3% of people are vegan. So, you know, uh, the whole argument for um, not getting natural nutrients is involved. I've, I've gone on a massive tangent there, haven't I? I mean, it, it relates to the point, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a tangent, I'd just say it's like an argument, per se. I need to bring it back to what the original question was, which I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> um, haunting me off your own. Ah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the vegan problem um, is not necessary. Um, I guess, as opposed to factory farming, it is a far more ritualized process, and there is a lot of effort that has to go into it, as opposed to just you know going to Tesco's and buying it. Um, but you've got to think: if are we talking about the whole world hunting, or you know just more and more people hunting? Because the, the factory. Well, not the factory farming system, but the fact that there's been so much subsistence farming in the UK means that a lot of the woodland where, you know, animals that would typically be hunted live, you know, so deer, rabbits and stuff. All, all this land is being used or was being used to, to breed cattle and stuff and sheep. So it's not really adequate enough to support a population of animals that the, the populate that can feed a population if they were to just hunt it if that makes sense mm -hmm. I get what you're so, saying so in order for uh, people hunting animals to be a viable source of them getting nutrients you know on mass we need to reduce the amount of 
uh, or we need to increase the amount of natural environments that there are. <laughs> Otherwise, we're only going to ever be able to support animals that are domesticated. I mean, one other, like, you know, one other kind of like point to justify like hunting is that, you know, it sometimes you may need it for certain ecosystems. So like some ecosystems have problems of like, you know, certain populations getting too high. And, you know, like as a consequence, the whole like ecosystem kind of collapses. Would you not agree that, that, yeah. Would you not agree that uh, the ecosystem is a system of balance and it will eventually balance itself out without human intervention? True. True that. I mean, I'm not I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that's a common argument that I always like. So say there's too many deer one year. Mm -hmm. That means that the deer will eat all the things that the deer usually eat and that means that there won't be as much stuff for the deer to eat next year so deer will die off and if there's less deer than there was than the you know the balance permits mm -hmm. then that means that there's going to be more nutrients which means that next year the deer population can regenerate and if it regenerates too much then there's going to be less stuff for them to eat which draws down the population that's true but in the process they devastate the ecosystem because it's not just that in year by year the deer die off it's like the deer will unchecked they'll just keep growing that population and devastating the rest of the ecosystem and then they'll die off but in the process like a great deal of destruction is done to the habitat you know and like that's why like when we killed all the wolves and the the americans killed all the wolves in yellowstone park and the deer population started to explode like it had a lot of ripple and after effects in the rest of the ecosystem and that's, they... that's a problem of people hunting deer more than the deer uh, people hunting wolves more than the deer being the problem yeah yeah and then we unbalanced the ecosystem yeah, and it got yeah. out of whack and we had to reintroduce the wolves in order to balance things back out again yeah yeah i agree hmm. i think that in conclusion we are philosophers are the wolves you know we are the samurais among men you know as the sakura is flower among flowers the free thinkers you know, that was probably the single most neck quote I've ever heard from you, Harry. <laughs> we use our thought like the blade of a samurai's katana. Putting hey, through taste. consensus opinions. <laughs> well, now you will taste the um, unholy wrath of my blade. Mm -hmm. The righteous Is fury. <laughs> Is that a euphemism? <laughs> <laughs> Aaron. Righteously furious blade. Right, shall we call the day? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, thanks, thanks for letting me ramble here. at your faces. Yeah. Um, I apologise if anything was uh, irrational or logically inconsistent. Um, but you know, it is a process. Honestly, like um, I'd love to have you like you know back sometime because yeah, this was a great podcast. Mm, mm. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to talk about something other than veganism. Of and course, like what kind of stuff? Human depravity. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll have to see. Terence McKenna. Yeah, could do, could do. That's that's a, that's at least four hour podcast worth of conversation. <laughs> All right, I'm ceasing recording. All right, sounds. Okay.